Ah yes, hello person who wishes to embark on the great frontier of bearded dragon ownership. I see that you may have a lack of knowledge as how to properly care for the lizard you so desire, but have no fear, I will gladly walk you through the basics of owning a bearded dragon. There are many steps to this whole process, including food, housing, diseases, lighting, where to get your lizard, and miscellaneous, but have no fear, as I am here to help you through. Now, I do wish for you to keep in mind that this video is not meant to be 100% of your research. This video is meant to briefly summarize most of the steps that you must take. There are many other things which you must research and consider when you are owning your bearded dragon. I shall also warn you that you might not follow these steps 100% all of the time, as it is your bearded dragon, and some bearded dragons have differing needs compared to the other bearded dragons. For example, a German giant bearded dragon will obviously require more food to grow than a normal bearded dragon. So do not take everything that you hear with the intention of following the steps to the maximum. If someone tells you to feed your lizard exactly 27.5 bugs per, pe per feeding, two feedings a day, take it with a grain of salt. You do you, assuming it is with the intention of improving the quality of life of your bearded dragon. So I think that it would be fitting to start with a very important thing that all mu bearded dragons must look out for. And that is certain diseases and illnesses. Oh, the horror. This part is one of the worst parts of owning a bearded dragon, considering they will very likely get sick at least once in their lifetimes. So I'll go over what you must try and avoid at all costs. This part is also a huge mouthful, considering there are a lot of things that you have to watch out for, and as sad as it may be, it is, some t it is something that we have to go over first so that you will know what I'm talking about in later segments of the video. MBD, or Metabolic Bone Disease. Bearded dragons need to have proper UVB so they do not get this disease, MBD, or metabolic bone disease. Uh, this is one of the most common and easily preventable diseases, and if they happen to get MBD, it will cause irreversible damage. Their joints begin to look rubbery, and they will begin developing difficulties depending on where the MBD is formed. Typically, it is not fatal. However, depending on where the disease forms, it can be very detrimental. If it forms on their jaws, they may have trouble eating. If it forms on their legs, they will have trouble moving around. Parasites. In certain cases, a bearded dragon may consume one thing or another that has parasites in them. The most common transmitter of parasites are crickets. Parasites are not really all that preventable, but there are certain things that you can do to try and prevent them. Don't, under any circumstance, feed bugs caught in nature, considering you have no clue as to where the bugs have been. Live caught bugs are typically parasitic. When it comes to bearded dragons, if they are not acting like themselves, or they are showing signs of rumation, which I'll go over in a bit, you might want to take a sample of their poop and give it to the vet so that they can determine whether or not your lizard has parasites. Some common symptoms of parasites are lethargy, reduced or abnormally high appetite, dehydration, and really stinky stools. These stools also look different from healthy stools. Here's an example. This is why you should have a well check for your beardy as soon as you can when you take them home and once every six months. Make sure to bring a stool sample with you just in case. Also, do your own research on a healthy versus unhealthy stool, considering I do not have to time to go into into depth with bearded dragon poop, you know. Then we have impaction, or more commonly known in human form as constipation, except much more detrimental for bearded dragons. Impaction is one of the biggest deals on the list, because if the symptoms of compaction are not taken to the vet, your lizard could very easily die. Some things that lead to compaction are improper temperatures and lighting, because without these, your beardy cannot digest food. The food that you feed them can also lead to impaction. If the food is too big, it can get stuck in their digestive tract. However, this type of compaction can easily be fixed considering the food is digestible. Perhaps the most dangerous impaction possible is impaction caused by substrate. For example, sand. I'll get into this later in the video, but sand can easily kill your bearded dragon. This will be more clear later on, but as of now, you need to take my word for it. If you have sand in your enclosure, get it out now! Your bearded dragon may eat the sand, and if they eat it, they will be unable to digest it, and you will need to remove it surgically. Some symptoms of impaction, as if your bearded dragon has not pooped in a very long time, 
I am not talking a couple of days. I am saying weeks without bowel movements. Some other things to look out for is if your bearded dragon is rejecting food, is lethargic, and even if, if it is completely inactive. If your bearded dragon is not acting normally and is showing these symptoms, get them to the vet immediately. Upper respiratory infections. Upper respiratory infections, or more commonly known as URIs, are extremely dangerous but very noticeable. If not caught, your bearded dragon will die. This can easily be prevented in the first place. You must keep the humidity in your beard if in your bearded dragon's enclosure low. 40% and lower is ideal. Anything higher is potentially dangerous. Some ways you can keep humidity down is making sure you have a good hygrometer. Uh, some might not be accurate and may even be broken. And have a lot of ventilation. Have the heat lamp on to evaporate any water in your bearded dragon's enclosure. And limit the amount of water in your bearded dragon's enclosure in the first place. Some symptoms of your eyes in your bearded dragon will be struggling to breathe. They can be lethargic, they may open their mouth to breathe, decreased appetite, and even weight loss. The moment that your bearded dragon shows any of these symptoms, take them to the vet as soon as possible. Tail rot. Tail rot is an extremely serious issue that has to be taken care of as soon as possible. Tail rot is when the tip of your bearded dragon tail begins to, you know, rot. This rot can continue up their tail until it has fallen off, which can make them infected, thus killing them. Or infect them. If that makes more sense. This is typically caused because of trauma caused to the tail, so at all costs, try not to step really hard on their tail. When you begin to notice the rot, take your lizard to the vet and get them care as soon as possible so you can avoid amputation of the tail, and it will not grow back. Brumation. Even though brumation is in this section, it is not a sickness. However, some of the symptoms of brumation can easily be associated with parasites and even compaction. A lot of bearded dragons brumate, and when they start, it is typically within the ages of 10 and 24 months of age. However, some bearded dragons don't brumate at all. It is really a toss-up, but you need to be ready when, for when it comes. Some symptoms of brumation is lethargy or plain sleeping, decreased appetite, pooping less, and sleeping for longer. As you may have realized, a lot of these symptoms can be attributed to sickness. However, it is definitely recommended to test your bearded dragon for parasites if they are showing brumation signs, because if they have parasites, they may go to sleep and never wake up. Shedding Shedding is most definitely not a sickness because every bearded dragon does it quite often. However, if they are shedding, they may be showing behaviors that you are unfamiliar with in your bearded dragon. For one, they may be lethargic and move less because of how uncomfortable shedding is. Bearded dragons hate going through a shed. They may also be snappy if you try to touch them when they are shedding. Overall, shedding passes pretty quickly without help from humans. However, there are some things you can do to speed up the process. Something you can do to improve the speed of shedding is to give them baths. When you give them baths, the water absorbs into their skin. When the water dries up, it makes their skin drier and thus causes it to chip off. That is the best thing you can do, but you can also spray their enclosure to make it more humid, thus giving off the same effect, or you can spray them directly with a spray bottle. However, something you should never do is pull the shed off directly. This can not only hurt and stress them out, but it can also damage the new scales underneath. So even if it looks like it would be satisfying to pull it off, just don't do it. It is bad in the long run. And one last thing you, you must consider when your bearded dragon is shedding is called stuck shed. This is not really all that harmful. It's only uncomfortable for your liver. L lizard. <laughs> Some things that you must do to get rid of stuck shed is to give them lots of baths. This is sort of a 50-50 toss-up to do as if it's going to work out, work out or not, but it certainly helps. If it doesn't work out, then you probably need to wait until the next time your bearded dragon sheds. Eggs. Obviously, this is only a thing for female bearded dragons. Typically, when your female bearded dragon is fully grown, they'll begin to lay eggs. Some signs that they are uh, about to, to lay is when they scratch at their enclosure and dig violent, violently. You'll also notice that your bearded dragon is getting abnormally fat and is eating a lot of food. They need a lot of calcium and nutrition so they can lay their eggs. If your bearded dragon is showing these symptoms, you need to make a lay box for them. You must do research about lay boxes, considering I cannot cover it all. However, long story short, if they show these symptoms, you need to fill a box with sand that is slightly wet so that they can dig in it and it will not collapse on them. However, I know what you may be thinking. These eggs do not have baby lizards in them. Only if they mate with a male bearded dragon do these eggs have babies in them. They'll spend a large portion of their day inside their lay box so that they can lay their eggs. Do a lot of research about how to deal with these diseases if they may show up because I do not have enough time to go over all of it.
Lights and heating is one of the most important parts of a bearded dragon's lifestyle. Firstly, let's get into the importance of having heating in different types of lamps. In the wild, bearded dragons need the sun. The sun is responsible for them being able to process calcium, digest their food, and keep them warm enough to live. Leading off with a vast lineup of lamps and light bulbs, we have heat lamps. It is fairly self-explanatory as to why you need this bulb. It gives off heat. This heat is important because it allows your bearded dragon to digest food and stay warm enough to function. If there is no heat in your reptile enclosure, they will surely be unable to function and will soon enough die. There are some other things that you have to consider, uh, and that is a thermometer for the enclosure. This thermometer is probably the best option. Link in the description. Don't get a thermometer that sticks to the side of the enclosure. You need it to have a probe so that you can measure the exact basking spot temperature. Speaking of temperature, time to talk about temperature and how you can adjust the temperature. There are multiple ways that you can adjust the temperature of the basking spot and the cool side. The first, and least cost efficient and most annoying, is to get different wattages for the lamp and put it inside an undimmable lamp fixture. Theoretically, you will eventually find a lamp that gets the right temperature for your lizard. However, I think the superior way of adjusting your reptile enclosure temperature is by using a dimmable lamp fixture. So if you put a 100 watt light bulb in an adjustable lamp fixture, which not only means you don't need to get a new light bulb if it is too hot or too cold, but it allows you to find the right temperature for your bearded dragon specifically. And speaking of temperatures, what are the ideal temperatures for bearded dragons? Well, on the basking spot, the best temperature for pretty much all bearded dragons ranges from 100 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the sheer power and beauty of the adjustable lamp fixture comes in. Some bearded dragons may prefer hotter temperatures, and others may prefer cooler temperatures. My bearded dragon prefers cooler temperatures, so considering I have the adjustable lamp fixture, I can find the exact temperature which she enjoys, which is 97 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit. However, you are going to have to find the right temperature for your bearded dragon. The next part I have to go over is the cool side of the enclosure. Hence the name, this part of the enclosure is cooler than the warm side of the enclosure. Typically, the ideal temperature around this area is 80 to maybe 85 degrees. However, this part of the enclosure does not need to be regulated very much, considering the heat lamp heats it up to a good temperature on its own. UVB lighting. Now that we've been talking about heat lamps for almost five years, I need to move on to something that's just as important. UVB lighting. This is something that many people really lack on, and it's not justifiable in the slightest. UVB is responsible for allowing a bearded dragon to process calcium. Without proper UVB, bearded dragons will get metabolic bone disease, which I have already covered. Believe it or not, the type of UVB bulb that you get matters far more than the heat lamp bulb. Because look at this coil UVB. Bad, bad, bad! These UVB bulbs not only give off an insufficient amount of UVB, but they are also unrealistic to a bearded dragon's natural environment. In the wild, the sun covers almost all areas a bearded dragon will be, which in these scenarios, the coil UVB only covers the basking spot, which is bad. Also, some brands of UVB bulbs can sunburn your bearded dragon and also cause eye damage considering of how concentrated the light is. I'm talking to you, Zilla UVB bulbs. As I stated earlier, the output of the coil UVB may in be insufficient for a bearded dragon, which means they may become less active, have trouble hunting their bugs, and MBD can even occur. UVB is one of the many things in a bearded dragon enclosure you cannot slack on, so get a strip UVB. If the UVB is on the outside of the enclosure, you will want to use a T5 bulb because it has a higher output than the alternative T8. You do not want a T5 inside of the enclosure because it may be too much UVB for your bearded dragon. So the rule of thumb is that the T8 is for inside usage and the T5 is for outside usage. I know from experience because I used T8 outside of the enclosure and my bearded dragon was fine. But when the bulb began to start dying, she began acting sick due to the lack of UVB. These UVB strips should span two-thirds of the enclosure, and you should change your UVB about every five to six months. Ceramic heat emitter. Lastly, we have the CHE, or a ceramic heat emitter. This lamp is far from as important as heat or UVB, but if your house is too cold, these are quite important. If your house temperature is somewhere around 65 degrees or even cooler, one of these is really important. While your bearded dragon will most likely not die, it will not be cozy for them. I'm talking about their sleeping temperatures. Lastly, I have something to get straight. 
don't use night lights. It is a common myth that bearded dragons can't see the red or blue lights, but it is not worth the risk. Bearded dragons benefit from having a completely de dark place to rest their chins. So the best answer is a CHE, ceramic heat emitter. Just like the heat lamps, they can go into the exact same picture. However, for these, I would 100% recommend that you use an adjustable fixture, considering you do not want it to be hot at night for your bearded dragon. You want it to be a, a good temperature at around 70 degrees. The first part we have to go over with this section of the video is the enclosure that you want for your bearded dragon. For a baby bearded dragon, the minimum requirement is 20 gallons. However, it makes no sense to have a 20 gallon enclosure considering you are going to have to upgrade it in the near future. If you have a 20 gallon enclosure, please upgrade it if your beardy is fully grown. Please. If their enclosure is too small, they will be unable to get proper exercise and can possibly experience stunted growth. Growth. So now that we have got that over with, we can talk about the next part. The minimum size for a fully grown bearded dragon enclosure is 40 to 50 gallons. If this is all you can afford or it is what your bearded dragon already has, it is perfectly fine. You do not need to upgrade. However, if you can, a 75 gallon enclosure is ideal. This gives them space to run around and stretch out. It also makes their lives more interesting and does a better job at imitating their natural environment and it keeps them nice and active. Substrate. Substrate is something that is extremely important, and you do not have to get it perfect, but you need to make sure that you avoid some things. Firstly, and most importantly, do not use loose substrate, dirt, sand, etc. Under no condition should you use a loose substrate. It is dangerous to not only the health of your beauty, but to the life of your beauty. The reason this loose substrate is so dangerous is because if ingested, it will impact your lizard. They cannot consume this stuff. If they have any loose substrate, replace it immediately. Immediately? <laughs> Immediately. And then do not feed them their bugs off of it, because if they lap up the sand or dirt or whatever with the bug, they will get impacted. There is also another loose substrate that is even more dam dangerous than normal sand. Calcium sand. This thing is the literal devil when it comes to bearded dragons. The devil! It deserves to be DANGED to hell! Why may you ask? Well, firstly, advertisers say that this sand is good because your beardy accidentally eats some. They will get a little extra calcium. Which is absolute bogus because there's so little calcium in this sand that it practically has no nutritional value. Also, if your bearded dragon has a calcium deficiency, it will start eating this sand because of the little calcium it possesses. Lastly and most disturbingly, if this sand is ingested, it will clump up in the stomach of the bearded dragon, which means that it is literally impossible to poop out, so it will cause impaction. The only way to get this sand out is by surgery. So if you're considering using this substrate, for the love of God, do not use it. Your beardy and your wallet will thank you. However, you may have the argument that your bearded dragons live on sand in the wild. 1. There's a reason bearded dragons live longer in captivity than in the wild, because humans can create a better environment for them even though it is artificial. 2. Bearded dragons don't even live on sand in the wild. They live on mostly a mixture of rocks and sand. So they do not live on only sand, they don't live on, you know, all that, that fluffy, delightful sand. They live, on, they live on a rocky surface, which is harder to ingest. So if you want to replicate their natural environment, you may want to use a sand mat, which does, doesn't have any loose substrate, but has an accurate feel to the natural environment of the bearded dragon, and it looks much more real. So, that brings us to which substrate should you use. I'm, I'm dissing on all of these loose substrates, so, so what's the answer? A substrate is something that really comes down to your preference and your lizard's preference. As long as you avoid some things, like loose substrate, you are free to do whatever substrate you want. So, I will go over some of the most common substrates. Repti carpet. A lot of people do not like repti carpet, for, but for me, it is my personal favorite. Many people do not like it because of how difficult it is to vacuum and how hard it is to clean. However, I have adapted to these problems. I hold down the carpet with towels and I only take it out to spray it with the hose every once in a while. 
I also have another carpet on hand all the time, so when I do not when I do need to spray it down and I'm leaving the other carpet out to dry, I can use I can use the, the secondary carpet and instantly put a new one in. The reason I do not need to spray it often is because my lizard does not poop in her enclosure. She only poops outside of it. This is really a blessing, even though we have to clean it off our floor, we do not have to clean her enclosure out very often. So if you have a fairly clean lizard, Repti Carpet is a very good option. Tile. Perhaps the fan favorite in the bearded dragon community, and that is tile. Tile has many advantages. First off, it's very cleanable. You, you simply take it out of the enclosure and spray it down, or you don't take it out at all. Just clean the poop right off. Also, it is a natural nail filer for the bearded dragons. So if your bearded dragon's nails are getting too long, when they run around, they'll be trimming them down naturally. Tile is also cheap, and you don't ever have to replace it. Lastly, it looks really nice and spices up the enclosure a lot. Despite all these advantages, there is a disadvantage. And that, has my, that is that you have to cut them down to fit the enclosure that you have, which really isn't a huge deal if you like the tile that you have. So clearly, tile is a very good option for your reptile enclosure. Possibly the best. Paper towers. Perhaps the most monotonous and melancholy substrate that you can possibly choose, paper towels are still a very good option. Firstly, it's very cleanable. When your bearded dragon poops on it, you throw it into the garbage, then you replace it. Second, it is cheap. Very cheap. Very, very cheap. Now into the cons. It's ugly. It gets scratched up by your lizard's claws. You can't vacuum it. You have to throw it away pretty much every time. Which, if you have trouble finding paper towels in the late pandemic, then that could also be a disadvantage enclosure decor. Now that we have finished substrate, we're on to something that is just as important. Enclosure decor. <laughs> the poor enclosure decoration. There are a few characteristics to enclosure decor. Substrate, which we just went over, basking spots, temperature probes, hygrometers, hides, and an optional comfy spot. Basking spots. A basking spot is a place up, the, up high that a bearded dragon can go to to get nice and warm. This basking spot should be comfy for them, because it is where they will spend the majority of their day. You can use really anything as long as it elevates them, but my personal favorite is a hammock. I prefer a good fabric hammock because you can use any type, really. This is a very good option, the zoomed-in repti carpet. Oh no, <laughs> the zoomed-in, <laughs> the zoomed <laughs> repti carpet. Sorry. So, the moral of this story, you can use anything that they can easily get into and get out of. Oh, and it, it might be good to note that it, can, it can't be toxic to the poor thing. Temperature probes slash hygrometers. I went over this briefly earlier, but I want to spend this time to go more in-depth into it. The link to the probe that I recommend is in the description, but you want a thermometer that measures the exact temperature of the basking spot. You don't have that, then you won't have an accurate temperature and you can potentially be dangerous. And it can potentially be dangerous to the little guy. You're also going to want to get a hygrometer. Typically, these things are pretty inaccurate and break down frequently. So you just need to get one for the cool spot of the enclosure because that is typically the most humid spot of the enclosure. Because of the heat lamp, the basking spot side is typically very dry. So you really do not need to worry about that side too much. But if you want to, then I would definitely recommend it. Hides and comfy spots. I need to get one thing straight before going into this segment. Hides are really important. You need at least a couple of them so that your bearded dragon has places to sleep and also has places to escape from the UVB every once in a while. Some really good options for a hide is a, is a basking spot that's a fabric hammock that has a built-in hide. Typically, you'll not find some of these specifically for reptiles on Amazon, so you may need to go to places like Etsy. However, if you look up things like rat hammocks or small animal hammocks, you can find hammocks that will work well for a, beard, for a bearded dragon. I would also recommend a hide that you can fit into the corner of the enclosure, because bearded dragons really like hiding as a place to sleep and also to escape from their UVB. Another thing that you can do to spice up your lizard enclosure is to have a cozy spot. A spot that they can go to every once in a while to either chill down or cool down. These are really good places that they can sleep in. <sighs> we have an example of a cozy spot in our lizard's enclosure. Um, my girl really enjoys the top part of the bed and she also goes down into the bed area as well to hide. And one last thing that I really have to get straight is cohabitation. This is another part that I had to go over and I cannot stress over enough. I would say very rarely, if not ever, should you ever house your bearded dragons in the same enclosure. I would say never. However, Lizard Guru made a video that explained possibly the only reason you should ever consider co-having your bearded dragon with another bearded dragon. I'd recommend checking it out. 
Anyways, back to why you shouldn't cohab your little lizards. Firstly, bearded dragons are extremely territorial and dominant towards other beauties, especially males. In some cases, bearded dragons will fight to the death for mating rights that do not even exist. If not, they'll most definitely fight for the best backing spots or for the most food. As cute as it might look that your bearded dragons are cuddling when you introduce them to each other, this will not be the case when you place a food bowl in front of them or it comes to mating season. Another reason you should not cohab is parasites. Cochidia is a common parasite that your bearded dragon may contract, and they can spread the parasite all around the enclosure, thus causing the other lizard to contract the parasite. So, instead of one sick lizard, you will have two sick lizards. I'd also recommend doing your research in the certain types of parasites that your bearded dragon may contract. The two main ones are pinworms and cochidia, so make sure you are knowledgeable about those parasites. So, that ends our segment on how to house your bearded dragons. What are some of the best foods for bearded dragons? This part is obviously extremely important, so I have to get things straight. Bearded dragons require a fresh salad and live bugs so they can function, not pellets or dead bugs. As much as I hate to break it to you, if you cannot handle either of these steps, a bearded dragon is not for you. So if you cannot handle the fact that your lizard will eat live and squirmy bugs, you can click off and drop the idea. However, if you can handle live bugs, congratulations! You made it to the next step! So I'll help you brave souls figure out what is the best bug for you and your bearded dragon. Crickets. Perhaps the worst option here, but a viable option for sure. First, I'll start you with the cons of crickets, considering there are far more than pros. Firstly, they are loud. You know, the relaxing sounds of crickets you heard in your backyard while playing Minecraft? Yep. Yeah. Well, they're coming from your house now, and it is a much different story. Secondly, they die faster than light travels. When you get a new shipment of crickets, the next day one-fourth of them will likely be dead as a, bug, as a bug smushed onto your rug or something. Third, they're hard to feed because they jump all over the place and attempt to escape constantly. Fourth, they are not the most healthy bugs. They aren't unhealthy in the slightest, but they aren't powerhouses, nutritious li- powerhouses of nutrition like dubia roaches. Lastly, and perhaps the most danging of them all, they carry parasites. Unlike a lot of different bugs, parasites run rampant through the cricket population. However, despite all of these cons, there are a few pros. First, bearded dragons love crickets. When given a cricket, they will consume and they will enjoy in the mast. Hmm. They will consume and they will enjoy in the vast majority of cases. Second, they are really cheap, which is good considering they die so quick. Third, they are really active, which means bearded dragons will be all over them considering they want to eat bugs that move. Dubia roaches. Dubia roaches are a fan favorite in the reptile community. Despite being roaches, these bugs are the saving grace. Jesus' is second coming, a dish that was handcrafted by Gordon Ramsay himself, and one dish that will milk your wallet dry. We will start with the pros this time, considering the, uh, considering you know, the, the, these roaches. <clears throat> They, they are absolute masterpieces. God knew what he was doing when he was inventing these things. Uh, firstly, the first pro is they are completely silent and they will not bite you. Something I forgot to mention about crickets. They will literally eat your lizard alive if you let them go around the enclosure unsupervised. Second, they are extremely high in protein and have a good amount of calcium in them. Third, they are hardy. They can live somewhere around two years. They do not die if they don't have the perfect climate. They will just not breed if they have a climate that is not natural to them. Fourth, they do not jump all over the place, which makes them easy to feed for your lizard. In other words, you do not have to pick them up with prongs and handle them. And you can handle them with your bare hands, or you can put them in the bowl for your lizard. It is a simple procedure. Fifth, lizards absolutely love them. Beauties lift these things up with ease and will go back for more, so you are pretty much guaranteed to have a happy lizard if they eat these bugs. Now that I've stated the pros, let's get into the cons. First, there are roaches, and roaches are disgusting. Second, they hide. If you let them go unsupervised in your lizard's enclosure, if your lizard does not eat them, they will hide for the rest of their lives. Literally the rest of their lives, unless you clean out your lizard's enclosure. And boy, they hide well. Third, they are expensive as a ton of gold or a bag of beef jerky. These guys will milk your wallet dry. For example, a shipment of about 500 dubia roaches will cost around $80, which this shipment will last you around two weeks if you're rationing your lizard. Lastly, they are not widely available. 
They're, typ they're typically only available online and in some places they are illegal because they could possibly become an invasive species, such as in, Fl in Florida, I know that's for sure, and there's a couple of other states, I think, and Canada. Black soldier fly larva. Oh yes, now onto my personal favorite. Black soldier fly larva, more commonly known as BSFL. These juicy, delightful luxuries have many pros and a lack of cons. Firstly, they are extremely high in calcium. So if you get some of these guys, you won't have to dust your larva in calcium powder. You feed them raw most of the time. Secondly, lizards typically like them. Bearded dragons will eat practically anything that moves and these guys are no exception. Bearded dragons most definitely enjoy them. Third, they move. That's right, folks. Black soldier fly larva move! While they do not move as much as dubia roaches and crickets, they do move, which means your, your lizard will eat them. Fourth, they are cheap as dirt and last as long as rock formations in the middle of the desert. While thousands of these guys cost around $30, dollars they can last you months, theoretically. However, this gets us to the cons. First, considering they're so high in calcium and can't really be dusted in calcium, this means you might miss out on D3, which comes in the calcium supplement most of the time. So you might need to get an extra supplement for the D3. Uh, but your UVB lighting will practically get them plenty. Well, the UVB lighting will typically get them plenty of D3, assuming you do it right. We'll get into light, and we've already covered lighting, so no need to go into that again. Secondly and lastly, they pupate and turn into flies. This is why they can theoretically last for months and do not actually last for months because you know they turn into flies. This means that you either have to feed the flies or kill them off. But don't release them into the wild because this can hurt the ecosystem depending on where you live. Now we're practically done with this segment, but I would 100% recommend doing research with the bug that you want to feed your lizard, because there are a ton of there are a ton of treat bugs like superworms and hornworms. Definitely do your research because there's also some other bugs which you can't feed them, like mealworms. Oh, uh, so that moves us on to our next segment that you really have to listen to intently, considering it's quite a lot to take in and is very important. Another very important part of feeding your bearded dragon is supplementation. Supplements are extremely important for the well-being of bearded dragons. I cannot go over everything considering supplements are too complex to go 100% in depth into. I must firstly elaborate on how often you should feed them. You should not feed supplements every day as too much of a good thing can be bad. So I would recommend giving it to them uh, every other day and rotating or every day and rotating between the certain types of supplements. And the rule of thumb is you should try and do all of these supplements a time, around three times a week. With every supplement, you should not completely cover the bugs and the good stuff, but you should lightly dust them. Now that that's covered, we can move into the different types of supplements that you may want to use. Calcium powder plus D3. Calcium and D3 are two things that are very important for a bearded dragon because the calcium helps the bones of the beardy and the D3 allows the beardy to digest the calcium. These two supplements typically come together in the same package, which is ideal for some people and bad for others. You want to have more control over the specific amounts of D3 and calcium that your bearded dragon consumes, you might want to get these supplements separately, which you can do. There are D3 supplements. However, if you aren't an overachiever, getting these two supplements in one package is perfectly fine. As I have stated, make sure to lightly dust the bugs in the calcium plus D3 powder, as you should do with all supplements. Multivitamin plus probiotic powder. Just like the calcium plus D3, this baby right here typically comes in a two-in-one pack. Just like the calcium and D3, you can get these supplements separately, and if anything, I would recommend getting these two se separately more than I would recommend getting the calcium and D3 separately. The probiotic powder has a bacteria that helps your bearded dragon digest its food and keep the bad bacteria in check. So this supplement should most definitely be used in your bearded dragon's diet, especially if your bearded dragon is having trouble pooping. The multivitamin is quite hard to research considering there's not a lot about the benefits other than it's necessary, but some people said that it made their bearded dragon more active, helps your bearded dragon grow faster, and it can also help your bearded dragon eat considering they enjoy the flavor of the supplement. I know this specifically from my liver, lizard, <laughs> I keep on saying liver, <laughs> whenever I put a bowl of dubia roaches in front of her with multivitamin and probiotic powder, she eats it all up. Bee pollen. Unlike the other two supplements, this one is a necessity, but it is, is, 
sorry, this one is not a necessity, but it is recommended. Bee pollen is what people think of when they hear the word crystal healing, but in reptile form. This stuff boots up the immune system of the bearded dragon. No limit to how much you can feed. It contains vitamins, minerals, and your bearded dragons will love this stuff. I'll say it again. It is not necessary. In fact, I've been too lazy to go around and get my beardy some bee pollen myself. <laughs> This is also a very important part of owning a bearded dragon. Where should you get your lizard? How do you prepare their home for your arrival? When you get them home, what do you do? So where should you get your bearded dragon? Obviously, an important part of owning a bearded dragon is actually getting it. Look, I understand. Sometimes you don't have that many options as to where you should get your bearded dragon, but at all costs, try to avoid pet stores like PetSmart and Petco. If you go to these places, the odds are you're getting a bearded dragon that has bad genetics and or has an illness of some sort. Also, if you get from a pet store, you're funding horrible care and also reptile mills, which mass-produce reptiles for the sole intent of selling them as pets. Also, this mass breeding is ruining the genes of bearded dragons as a whole. So if you can, avoid these massive pet stores. The ideal place to get your bearded dragon is online or in local stores. There is a great reptile store in my area that keeps great care of their reptiles and has awesome staff. So if you can find something like that in your area, that would be great. I got my lizard from this reptile store and she has never shown any signs of having a genetic disease, nor was she sick out of the store. Also, another very viable option is getting a lizard from a breeder online. A great option is Morph Market. However, even though you're practically guaranteed to get a well-bred and well-socialized reptile from an online breeder, you miss out on seeing what they're like in person, and you cannot get a, a personal connection to the lizard. I was fortunate enough to go in, uh, in to go in person, especially during COVID, and that was the reason I was able to get the lizard I love today, because of the way she acted when I picked her up for the first time. So both of these options are very viable. Now I know what some of you might be thinking. You don't want your reptile delivered in the mail. While that is understandable, I want you to realize that lizards have to be shipped in the first place to get to the store, so don't let that sole fact hold you back. How do you prepare for your beardy's arrival? The best way to prepare for your bearded dragon's arrival is to have the enclosure ready for them before you arrive. You do not want to be panicking trying to get their enclosure ready when they have gotten home. This is really all that you can do to prepare, That are, but there are also th some things you should do while taking them home or when you have taken them home. When you are taking them home from the pet store, I would recommend getting a carrier because one, it is depressing seeing it is depressing having to carry them home in a cardboard box. Two, if they are not going to be put in a box, you want you're going to want to have to have something to put them in while you are on the ride home. However, most of the time your beardy will have a box to go home in. It is also nice because if you ever need to take them somewhere in the future, you'll have something to do. I stated very briefly in the last section, but I also want to elaborate on it. When you take your beardy home, you are going to want to get them an appointment with the vet as soon as possible. A lot of the time, beardies can experience trauma or eat something parasitic when they are in the hands of breeders or sellers, especially from reptile stores or pet stores, considering most of the time bearded dragons are fed crickets and can get abused by other beardies, considering they are being homed in the same enclosure, which in this situation is fine, considering baby bearded dragons are not dominant or aggressive towards other lizards, but it is still not ideal considering accidents do happen. The hardest part of bearded dragon ownership. I am warning you, this part is not for the faint of heart. This is something that a lot of people cannot handle, and that is having to wait two weeks before taking them out for the first time. I know you've probably fainted in your chair and you are weeping at the top of your lungs. However, you need to do your best to not take them out for at least a week. They need this time to get adjusted to their surroundings. Regrettably, I did not follow this rule, but for good reason. My lizard was very social from the very beginning. She always wanted to be out exploring and chilling with the fam. Like, if she did not want to be taken out for a two-week period, I would not have pushed it. But she was super social from the very beginning. Different types of bearded dragons. This is another important part of owning a bearded dragon. Which flavor do you want? 
There are in fact quite a few different types of bearded dragons, including hypos, hypo zero, zero, citruses, silkbacks, luggerbacks, paradox, translucent, genetic stripe, red, german giant, normie. <sighs> all of these have varying prices from about 30 bucks all the way up to, let's see, a thousand dollars, depending on how rare the morph is. So if you have quite a bit of money on you and you want to get a unique morph of bearded dragon, you can in fact do that. Just make sure you do your research because I could spend all day explaining all of the different morphs, morphs and I only have so much brain power. Well, we have now reached the end of the line. Outside that, you are ready to go out and get your new bearded dragon, but that is simply not the case. This is a video that is supposed to scrape the surface of how to care for bearded dragons, and I really want you to encourage to do a lot more research than just this video, you know, 40 minutes later. Despite what people say, these are not easy pets to care for. These pets are very hard. While they may be easy for a reptile, they are not easy pets. So if you're looking for a simple animal for your little six-year-old, this is not the pet. So before the video ends, I'll do a final summary. Bearded dragons, some of the best pets you can possibly get. In reward for the hard work you will inevitably have to do, they are some of the most loving creatures that you can find. Needing a nice spacious enclosure, live bugs, good lighting, quality substrate, and lots of love. When people say that bearded dragons are not expensive pets, that is a lie and a half. I went into bearded dragon ownership thinking that it would be fairly cheap, and boy oh boy was I misinformed. This scaly little friend cost my family thousands of dollars because of the price of the enclosure, all the lighting, but mostly because of the food. So if you're going into bearded dragon ownership, be ready to pay quite a couple of pretty pennies. So go ahead, if you're up for the challenge, go and get yourself a bearded dragon. If you are committed, I can assure you, it is one decision that you will never regret. Bearded Dragons 101 Oh, <laughs>